since Ryan Miller and for the past 15 years have helped hundreds of people to raise millions of dollars for their funds and for their startups. If you're serious about raising money, launching your business, or taking your life to the next level, this show will give you the answers so that you too can enjoy your pursuit of making billions. Let's get into it. In this week's episode, I bring on my dear friend, George Eakins. George is the co-founder and principal of an $800 million equity under management fund known as the American Dream Fund. Join George and me as he walks us through an obscure clause in U.S. immigration law that has allowed him to raise an insane amount of money for U.S. businesses from overseas. You don't want to miss it. Plus, George walks you through his exact process on how to fundraise overseas while placing capital in U.S. businesses, all to strengthen our community in our pursuit of making billions. Here we go. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have one of my dear friends, George Eakins. George is the principal and co-founder of American Dream Fund. They currently have $800 million of equity under management. Now, this is an interesting fund that's raised buckets of money by combining immigration and investment, known as the EB-5 in immigration program in the United States. What this means is this guy knows what he's talking about when it comes to inventive ways of raising capital. George, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks, Ryan. I really appreciate you having me here. Uh, I, I've known you for a while, and I've heard a lot of the podcasts, and I, I really enjoyed listening to all the other fellows talk, and uh, I'm happy to share my story. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so glad that you're on here, and, and certainly, uh, you know, your bright lights are added to the many that have come before you, and, and your very generous spirit, and the amazing things you've done, man. I can't wait to get into it. Um, but before we do, you know, a lot of people... You know, we we we're going to get to know George today, but I think a lot of people listening to this show, whether it's a funder or founder, they're just starting out. Um, you know, at one point, you weren't George Eakins that you are today. You started out; you were a guy. You were you were working in in international business. Maybe walk us through a little bit of how it started for you, and then you can kind of bring us up to how you know some of the stuff you learned along the way and how it uh, evolved into this. Goliath fund that that you now run today. So where did it start for you? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, I always knew I wanted to do international business. I didn't know what it was. But uh, back in grade school, I had a, uh, a, a teacher who said, and it was surprising, he was a history teacher, yeah. not an economics teacher. But he said, you know, if you, if you could just sell one yeah. tube of toothpaste to every Chinese person, you'd be a billionaire. And I really took that to heart. And I thought, wow, mm-hmm. can I ever do that? Uh-huh. In college, I studied international business, and I actually studied Chinese, and um, it, it, it's worked out well for me. Um, so early in my career, I knew I wanted to do international business, but I really didn't know how to get into it, or really what right. was international business, even though you study it, and, and things you learn in school are great for theory, but the practical aspect, how do you get your foot in the door? So the first job I had, it was in logistics. Uh, worked for a company for a, a couple of years, worked my way up those ranks um, from really the very bottom and got myself into a sales position. I did okay, but they had like a, a, a kind of a more entrepreneurial program. They said they were gonna take three guys or gals and they were gonna ship them off to their overseas locations and see how they did as far as business development. And I. I was one of the lucky few that got that position. So they sent me over to Taiwan because of my Chinese speaking ability. And uh, I, I worked there for a year, worked my butt off, had a great time and learned a lot, a little bit more about what international business was, but kind of international trade. And uh, it just so happened that I was going down in an elevator and there was an American CEO of a, of a company and in that same elevator, we started chatting and after a couple of beers, he confided into me, I confided into him about all the, you know, trials and tribulations of yeah. working overseas and all the fun stuff that we were doing. And maybe he had one too many cocktails, but he said, you know what? I've run into a problem. So really, what, what is it? He goes, well, I, I, I have this factory in China and it's upside down. I got uh, my, my team over there. They're like stealing employees and they're starting up their own factory. And would you believe it? They actually are starting the factory right next door to mine. So they're like taking supplies over. They're just doing all types of crazy stuff. He goes, I, I don't even know who I can trust anymore. He goes, but George, you know, I, I, the short time we've known each other, I think you're a guy with integrity and 
I like how you think and your thought process on things, and you're really inquisitive. So, you know, would you join me over in China just as a kind of a to get to know it, see if you'd be interested? And I was apprehensive. I was like 22, 23 at the time, and I was living life in Taiwan, you know, doing doing what I was doing, making a good living. And I said, well, you know, the, the offer's got to be really good to duplicate what I've got here because I'm on this program and everything. And he goes, well, what are you making? And I said, X. And he goes, well, here, how about X times two? I said, That's not bad. I said, okay. I said, well, you know, living over there, how's living? He goes, well, I'm going to show you what living's like. And then he said, well, it, you know, you want free living? I said, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Do you want a driver? Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> Do you want a mate? He, he's like set everything up for me just to to, to really yeah. make it beautiful yeah. situation. Um, so I went over there and, and had like a three day kind of introductory course, and it was it was beautiful. Everything he showed me, and then uh, I yeah you know, put in my notice and um, started working a month later. And um, you know once he left, then all the beauty and everything kind of fades away, and you're like in the in the thick of things, and it gets real tough. Uh, but we were successful. We did we did amazing things at that factory. We ended up getting that thing. It was originally running like eight hours a day. We only had a limited number of orders, but we got that thing running 24 hours a day. We had over a thousand uh, people that were in the factory doing their little widgets and stuff like that. And I was really happy that after four years, I had accomplished everything I wanted to do. And okay, well, what's next? And my family's always been in real estate. So I said, okay, well, let's let's try my hand at that. So I came back to the States and um, went to work for a company called Marcus Melichap or IPA and put my hand in there and, and worked there for a number of years and worked my way up and was doing quite well and making a good living. But it was never really my heart's desire. You know, the, the whole dialing for dollars was not my deal. I really wanted to be on the inside of the deals and really learn about the real estate and how to operate it and how to improve it. So 2008 hit, and I, you know, that was the great financial recession. That was that was hard that was on fun. all of us. Yeah. It was especially hard on anybody that was in real estate brokerage because there was no transactions oh, yeah. going on. Um, and I had a, I had a yeah. young family at the time, and a buddy of mine uh, came to me. He was my fraternity brother. And he said, "Hey, I've, I've been working for the governor of mm-hmm. Washington State, and mm-hmm. there is this." company, small company that has been using this EB-5 investment immigration program. I said, EB what? And he had to teach me about it and everything. And he said, he's essentially been bringing money from China and all over Asia and investing into the port. And that he's purchased so many properties in the port that he's now holding the port hostage. And that he's been able to raise all the rents on all the, all the different warehousing and stuff like that. He said, his job was to learn everything about this program and how he did it. So I, I now know the program. I said, you have the contacts and China, you speak Chinese, we can put something together. And I didn't have much of a choice at the time. When I'm, I'm not a huge person, huge guy on doing yeah. government programs. There's always so, many, so much red tape and so many issues with it. But I looked at it and went, well, what else am I going to do? I got nothing else because my, my job at brokerage was kind of dying out. So I, I spent the next year and just learning about it, um, called up old professors and said, hey, I'm looking at this. What do you think? Do you know anything about it? Do you have any contacts there? And just exercising every relationship that I had and made a number of trips out to China, talking to my old buddies in the factories and meet with government officials, both in China and also in the U.S., trying to put trade missions together do everything I can to understand about how do I actually source investors for this program. And just to take you back a little bit about the program. So EB-5 Investment Immigration, it was a little known program. It's become a little bit more well-known now, but it was created in the 1990s. And it's a program that allows high net worth investors an opportunity to earn themselves and their family a green card through investment. Now, the investment needs to create 10 new long-term jobs for U.S. people. U.S. person is a citizen or a green card holder. So the great thing about the program is that it's bringing in substantial capital to the United States that uh, is going to create the new tax bases, but it's also creating a lot of jobs for people, mm-hmm. for U.S. people. So it's it's, wow. it's huge. It, it's just all the benefits it does for Yeah, and I love it. And my understanding is when you guys started, you were like one of maybe 19 or 20 people in the entire country that were doing That's really what it, what it was, is that wow. um, at the time, it, even though it was created in 1990, 
it had gone through certain iterations and problems, but it fell out of fanfare. And at the time that we started getting into it in 2008, there was less than 20 companies that were involved in it. And there was probably two big ones, but still they only did maybe 20, $30 million a year. It wasn't much. And so we looked at it and said, okay, how do we get involved in it? And, and just started working really hard and spent a lot of time at it and um, started off slow. It took a year to really get our, our feet wet and get our first deals just to come out of the market, out to the market. Um, but once we did, and that first deal was the hardest deal I've ever done. Hardest deal to raise the capital, hardest deal to put together, hardest deal to, to hold it together because the way the capital comes in, it's unique and that you have all these hurdles that you got to deal with. You have investors that are for, foreign and they're offshore and they have to satisfy their immigration requirements. It takes a while to put a half a million dollars together for them to be able to send it over to the U.S. and to put it into play. And essentially what we do is we aggregate multiple investors together in order to make one investment, substantial investment into a ground up development project. Perfect. And is it, um, is, are the investments that you do, uh, for those people that are listening, is that limited to real estate or is it any kind of asset class? So it really can be any, any type of asset class, as long as it satisfies the main requirements with EB-5 uh, law or legislation. And the, the first requirement is that the capital that's coming in, you have to sure, uh, prove the source of that capital has to be clean. And you have to show tax records and all the background on how you made that first dollar. And you have to show the path of the funds of coming all the way to the United States. And there's a lot of challenges in certain countries, whether it be China, US, China, Vietnam, India, they have currency controls. So they can only uh, export or uh, convert so much currency to U.S. dollars every year. Um, but you have to show that whole path, that whole source, and then they have to go through background checks. So it's, it's challenging from that perspective. But as far as the investment that you're making, it can be in almost anything as long as it satisfies, the investor satisfies their requirements and that it's going to create the 10 new long-term jobs and be invested into, it can be invested anywhere in the United States, but you get a benefit or the investor gets a benefit if it's invested in a targeted employment area or a rural area. And a targeted employment area is, or a TEA, is any area that has significantly high unemployment. So 150% of the national average. Then the investment previously used to be a million dollars. Now it's 1.2. But uh, instead of being a million dollars, it now got slashed down to half a million because the government was trying to incentivize people to make investments into that, that, that area or mm -hmm. those areas so that they could help boost up those areas. And uh, by far and large, uh, all of our investments, um, we have uh, a little over, oh, more than a half a billion dollars, close to a billion dollars of capital that's been invested. Um, and it's all been invested in those targeted employment areas. Uh, so we were really happy with that. We're, we're really satisfied with you know, the contribution that we've given um, through this program that's helped the United States, that's helped these investors to realize their American dream. It's just very satisfying and, and, and makes your heart feel good and helps you sleep at night that you've done something good. Yeah, I absolutely love that, George. And, um, you know, you mentioned that there are some background checks as well. Um, is that, is that like CIA or what, what are we talking here? Like how, how extensive are those background checks? Any agency under the department of defense. So you got CIA, FBI, <laughs> Good. but every agency that's doing their own individual background checks. Now, the governing body or agency is United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, previously, it was called the INS. Um, that is the, the agency that regulates and that processes or adjudicates all the petitions. But they are working together with all the other Department of Defense agencies to vet every individual that's coming through. And it's not a fast like rubber stamp vet. They really do due diligence. Where we've had investors, their background, They've actually flown out there and, and double checked on the background of these investors to make sure they're who they are and that they've raised or they've made that capital the way that they say that they're making it. And it's not just mysteriously showing up in a, in a brown baggie. Wow. So I hope investors or founders who are listening to this can understand and say, look, there's a fund out there. If you're international, there's a fund out there that can invest um, 
into businesses that's creating at least 10 jobs in the United States. So U.S. founders especially would, would be able to benefit from some of the capital that you're providing as long as they help you to meet that criteria for the international capital. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's you know, We're not the only player out there. Um, now, uh, <laughs> originally one of 20 uh, back in 2008. Now, 2022, there's probably close to a thousand different companies that are doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, the program has gone through another iteration. There's been new legislation that's been introduced, and there's a number of people have gotten out of it because, as government goes, there's more and more red tape. Mm-hmm. It's more challenges to the program. So it's not for the faint of heart, um, but it, it does a lot of good for the United States, and you can raise a significant amount of capital. And what's great about it, what I truly like, is it's unique. Mm-hmm. It's unique capital, and it's something different than what most other fund managers are doing. And that you're able to really be, you've got a smaller number of people that are doing it. And you're, if you become an expert in it, um, you can really go out and, and, and help, uh, not just the United States, but help projects that wouldn't otherwise be able to get funding to get funding. And we've done private, par- private public partnerships, um, ground and development of hotels, resorts, casinos, apartment buildings, We've done a number of assisted living facilities. But there's also like um, a number of other people that are doing schools, like charter schools. Um, so the, the capital can go in almost anything. It can go into venture capital as well. Mm-hmm. It's much more challenging just from a marketing standpoint. And that what we've learned from our investors is that they want not so much a return uh, on their investment. Usually the return on investment is pretty low. Because mm-hmm. um, the main thing that their their goal is to get the green card from this. But what they want is a return of their investment. Yeah, so they want some type of collateral, some type of safety of their investment. This is not a crapshoot for them. They're not rolling the dice. They really they they need to get this immigration. A lot of it's because they're they're changing their whole family. They're moving their whole family to the United States to start that American dream. Yeah, no, that that's absolutely perfect, man. So uh, different asset classes are certainly open for for investments. Um, and then you mentioned the the EB-5 program. There's a couple of criteria. I wonder if you can just summarize that. You mentioned there's certain areas. And what are some of those things that these investments need to be in order to get capital from you? And, and this is where it gets a little bit trickier. Um, we welcome people to come to our website and to learn more about it. We have FAQs on it. That goes through yeah. the whole process. But it, yeah. it comes down to, to a couple of major things. The, the number one... The project needs to be located within a regional center. And a regional center is a predetermined geographic area that has already been petitioned to USCIS for a specific company. So we own uh, five or six different regional centers throughout the United States. So there's areas that we've already been like pre-classified that we can do business in those areas. Um, the second is, is that uh, you get a, the investor gets an economic benefit through a lower threshold of investment if they invest in a targeted employment area, so a more depressed or higher unemployment area, or a rural area. And that's to incentivize more investment to go into those areas. And the third key component is job creation. You need evidence that through that investor's investment, and you need to show the nexus from the investor's investment to job creation. How did that capital create those jobs? And each investor, so each, whether it be half a million or a million dollars needs to be able to show that they've created 10 new long-term jobs. Now, the benefit for us is that because we own and operate regional centers is that the way that we account for jobs is through an economic methodology. And these are all approved by the government. The government uses them. There's very common ones are like RIMS2, Implan, and an economist puts it together. And essentially what it says is that through your investment, of the EB-5 investment, as well as other investment that's coming into it, how many uh, what, how many jobs would be created through the input of your capital through construction costs and the output through revenues? Is that going to create the total number of jobs in all these different industries? And you're creating jobs both directly, people that are, say you're doing a hotel, which is very common. You have people that are working in construction, you get credit for those jobs. People that are working at the operations, you get credit for those jobs. Those are called direct jobs. The other you get benefit for, which is quite significant, is indirect jobs. 
So a hotel that's uh, farming out there, uh, whether it be dinner services or laundry services, is a big one. Yeah. Send out the landscaping, laundry, yep. creating in, in, indirect employment, and you also get the benefit of induced uh, job creation. And induced job creation is because you built this new half a billion dollar hotel that now that's creating it's increasing the tax basis in that whole area. But all those people indirect or all the indirect and indirect people that are working there are now going out and shopping in those areas. So the mm -hmm. grocery store is gonna be making more money. So the grocery store needs to create more jobs. So you're getting benefit of that induced employment. Man, that is incredible. So, um, and there's many other immigration programs that are out there. Um, you know, there's investor visas, there's L1. I, I mean, I'm by no means an expert. I just, you roll in these circles, you hear about them, but an L1 visa for an executive or investor visa, this is kind of an investor visa a little bit as well. Uh, or, you know, starting a small business, I should say. But, um, you know, what's what are some of the great things that investors like about the EB, EB-5 program that you found? I think the, the biggest benefit is that um, historically it's been the fastest uh, visa category that you can get uh, hmm. to go from nothing to getting a green card, from being a foreign national to getting a green sure. card. Um, there's, because of the... the the challenges with the program, it's now taking a little bit longer for people to go through that process. Uh, but still today, it's likely the fastest process. It's definitely much faster than family based, depending on the country. Um, and it's it comes with less complications. So you have two different types of, of products. Uh, you have EB-5, that is just a one off whereby that investor can come in and create their own business. Mm -hmm. But they have to show how many direct jobs they're going to be creating and they have to with that half a million or million bucks, they have to be creating those 10 new jobs and they have to be almost in perpetuity. You have to show for like five, seven years that those jobs are still in existence, I-9s and W-2s. With the, with the EB-5 Regional Center program that we do, for the investor, it's a passive investment. They invest into a security where they become a limited partner and we are the general partner and we do everything for them. So they get the immigration benefit, they get um, return of investment and return on investment through that vehicle, but they're not having to deal with the day-to-day -day ins and outs of running and operating a hotel or other type of business, which most of these people, they have other jobs. Yeah. They have other businesses that they're trying to run. Yeah. Trying to run another company just for immigration would be just too challenging. It's not likely. Most people don't do it. So about 99%, 98 to 99% of the EB-5 program is through the regional center program mm -hmm. because it's by and large a passive investment for them. And do you do this just for yourself or can someone hire you to fundraise for their deal? Like they can hire you to say, I need to raise a hundred million dollars or 10 million, whatever. Can you guys go and fundraise for me? Since you're already a regional office, can we use you as a, as a capital raiser? Very good question. In fact, we, we don't do it for our own account, but we have, um, whether regardless of us having development experience yeah. um, or re uh, real estate experience, uh, we really look at uh, being a shepherd uh, of that capital yeah. to ensure that it's being placed into the right projects. So we don't invest into our own projects. We invest exclusively into other projects. So generally we're doing a JV with another company yeah. That is a development company where we're providing either the equity capital or uh, some type of MES financing mm -hmm. for it or a blend of the two. And there, that developer is able to do with their expertise is and develop. Mm -hmm. And we do what ours is, is that we bring additional capital to fill that capital stack. Awesome. Yeah, that's incredible. Generally, a developer is going to get a, uh, a friendlier capital because that capital needs to meet those uh, immigration requirements. So it's uh, it's sticky capital, yep. meaning it's going to sneak in there either through thick and thin. Um, and it's it's looking for a, a return of investment but on, and on investment, but the on investment is not as critical as making sure that the project gets completed and that uh, it satisfies all the immigration requirements. Yeah, I love that. So, um, you know, what are what are some of the, since you're, you're you know that, like I, uh, I always joke, um, so you know the dark arts of capital raising, uh, like I do. But what are what are some of the takeaways? I mean, people coming on this show making billions are like, "Teach me how, brother." So you know what what are some of those takeaways? Uh, let's say in raising capital, what what are some advice you can give to to our listeners around the world? You know, honestly, I, I 
I've been involved in this business now for more than a decade and it's really because of perseverance mm. and that um, I, I, I had a need, I obviously needed a job, but I had, <laughs> yeah. I had a desire. Um, I, I wanted to go out there and, and I really wanted to become the best at what I was going to be able to yeah. do and um, learn and, and, and access all the resources that I possibly could. Um, I had a, I had, and I still have a lot of energy for what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I love what I'm doing. I love the people that we work yeah. with. Um, I've got a good team that's around us. I've got good staff. Uh, we generally try to run a more lean company, so we uh, you know, outsource a lot of stuff. We have a great council. They don't work for, for, for us directly, but we work with the best out there. Um, we have economists, we have um, appraisers, we have all these you know, uh, analysts that, that work for work for us, but they're all like 1099 and, and independent. Um, but so you, you know, really working with the good people, surrounding yourself with those. Um, the other is, I like to make friends with everybody. I know and you do. Yeah, <laughs> I you know I like people. Yeah. So, but what what I found that's unique, I think, and I, I other people have commented on it, is that while I'm very friendly, obviously, with anybody that's working with us and and that's partnering with us, and and we're serious when we come down to business, but we're very friendly yeah. in that process. But I'm friends with all my competitors. Mm. I love them. Yeah. And I've learned a lot from them. And I've learned a lot not to do yeah. and also what I can benchmark off of what they're doing to make myself better. And really, if you if you utilize that and, and you become friends with your competitors, they'll make you better and you and, and you'll make them better. And it's the ones that want to be your friends that are going to be the best. Um, and I and I still even like today I was having a conversation with all right, a decade ago. He and I were competing against a deal. He stole the deal from oh. me. Yeah, we made great friends afterwards, and we still go back and forth, and we do business together today. You, know, it's, it, you just don't know where those opportunities are going to turn out. So I'm always looking for good opportunities, um, whether it's inside my core competency or outside, to see how I might be able to, to utilize it. And, and our company is branched out and started doing private equity and other things as well cool. because we've seen that need. Yeah. And I've seen our competitors do it, and I've, I've been able to benchmark of what they're doing and learn from that. But it's, it's been really good. Um, you know, try to, you know, surround yourself with the best people. Um, you know, partnerships are always have, have its challenges. It's a marriage. Yeah. You know, marriages, you know, they're tough. Um, but you got to be able to figure it out. And uh, if you are able to figure it out and be able to make things work, it, it becomes a great, a great, uh, a great way, a great, a great opportunity to, for you both to grow and um, to really flourish. Yeah which I, I think our partners have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that, man. So, you know, um, leaning into your competitor, sometimes I, I jokingly call it co-opetition. So it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, th I like those, man. It's like, yeah, I'm going to get you. Like, it's not, it's not hostile. You're all in the business. You know what it is. You're here to win. And so are they. And, and sometimes a, a healthy co-opetition can actually make you both perform it can unlock the animal spirits that, uh, you know, empires are built on. There's a little dramatic spin, but competition, having the right team as well as the right competitors. I mean, I mean, you know, uh, we know a few mutual friends who played in the NFL, man, they would agree. They're like, yeah, like me against Little League, it's not anything. But if I if I'm coming at someone's coming at me as hard as I can, as, as I'm coming at them and it is a worthy competitor, it makes you play at the top level. And, and that's glorious to see so and, and the great thing is that where i've seen that benefit is that the the folks that we have that friendly cooperation and as we're competitors yeah um when we come to the table for that investor yeah. there's only two of us there yeah. everybody else is out. <laughs> they're like this is not competition you know, they, they, they can see right through it and they go okay i i, I see what you're doing and i see what they're doing yeah. and the, the rest of the pack is way back here so then, then you're just fighting between the two of you, and that's good. You, you've, you've eliminated everybody else. You eliminate ten other people from the room. That's great. Yeah, that's that's. The incredible. other thing I would say is that you know, as I got into this business, man, it was it was really tough. I had no idea what I was doing. I just did it. Good. And I corrected I corrected my course along the way. Like I, I went in there. I was thinking it was going to be like this. Oh no! I did dog you know, dog leg to the right yeah. and started doing something else. And and it just little different iterations change along the way. But until you just say, 
do it. You're going to sit there and find all these excuses for not doing it. And you just got to dive in head first. And as long as you're committed and you have that perseverance and energy, you'll succeed. Yeah, you're, you're, you're a perfect example of uh, day one beats one day, right? Like day one is just get started, man. Don't be like, well, one day when I'm this or one day when the, the world is perfect, then I'll start my business. Then I'll make that investment. Then I'll ask this person to marry me or or, or no longer marry me. Um, whatever that is, um, you know, just start, right? Just start. So, as, yeah, man, that's incredible. And it, it, dude, I, I'm, I'm super into this story. So I, I think you and I are going to have many more conversations if it's up to me. I know you're a busy guy. Oh, I, I, I love this. I'm sharing this story. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of other programs out yeah. there that are, are similar to or different than, than EB5. Um, as I, as I talk to like, the younger generation and even my kids and stuff like that, they, they ask me, okay, dad, or my, my friend's kids across the yeah. street, like, you know, you've been successful. What, what's your secret? I'm like that. No real secret. Yeah. I worked hard yeah. and you know, yeah. I, I, I was lucky, mm-hmm. but you know, I think I created my own luck. I put myself in the room, number one. Yeah. And then I tried to surround myself with good other people and I just persevered. And that's and everything else just kind of happens along the way. So just get in there and do it. Awesome. And the other, I think the one thing that I, I really enjoyed about my particular business line, yeah. though, is it's unique. Yeah. And that you know, there's a, there's a lot of ways to make money, and you can be competing against a thousand people, a hundred thousand people, a million people. Mm-hmm. But if you can find something you're only competing against twenty others, yeah, okay, you got a competitive edge. Um, and then you can build your company on that. So if you're able to find something that's unique, yeah. that's um, that gives you a big lift. Yeah, brother, preaching the choir, man. I I absolutely love that. And that's solid advice. Whether you're a funder or a founder, you found a way to back when you started. You were literally one of only 20 people in the entire country of the United States. You're one of 20. That's a big country. So you were definitely unique. Um, and you have figured out a way to not only raise capital, but do it in an inventive way where, you know, our family offices, all these people get pitched for you know, all kinds of things. You say, well, no, this, there's a different angle on that. And so for our listeners around the world, it's saying like, you don't actually have to reinvent something completely out there. Sometimes products come along that are evolutionary. They're just the natural evolution of the existing what we got. And sometimes they're revolutionary. And learning the difference between an evolutionary product and a revolutionary product can make the difference between actually commercializing something or not, actually having traction or not, right? So, so you provided, and, and I would argue that majority of projects that hit are actually evolutionary more than they are revolutionary, right? And so some revolutionary things happen and, and they're absolutely, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a VC man, so I'm on the edge of my seat on like, you know, new energy stuff that's happening and fission. Yeah. And fusion. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So there are some revolutionary stuff and they get all the press, but people who start their businesses often, they're just saying like, what if I just turn this dial a little bit to the right or the left, just this natural evolution of what's available now. And it unlocks a massive amount of value. And you've certainly done. So, you know, as we, as we wrap things up, is there anything else you would like to just include or any takeaways that you feel like, uh, our listeners around the world would want to. Yeah, so we're, we're in the marketplace. We're, we're always doing exciting new stuff. So if anybody has interest in learning more about our company, about us, go to our website. I'm happy to, to spend a couple of minutes and chat with people. Yeah. And, and you'll learn a lot about this program and the types of things that we're, we're looking at doing um, through our FAQs and stuff like yeah. that. Um, honestly, Ryan, this has been exciting for me. I really enjoy the, the, the time with you. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you've done some great things in business and you know, this is how I we kind of found each other and I've always been real impressed with it. Um, but I really, I think what's key here is your love and interest of the people um, that's authentically drawn unique individuals to you. Um, I, you know, keep doing what you're doing because uh, you're helping many of the young aspiring fund managers out there. And even those of us uh, kind of older dogs here been around the block get better. So I, I, I I really enjoy listening to the podcast. I, I enjoy uh, our friendship yeah. and, and uh, enjoy uh, seeing everything that you're doing. 
So keep it up. You betcha, man. I appreciate you. You're very kind. And, and likewise to you, I mean, you're certainly an inspiration to me. All the stuff you've been able to put together. Um, and again, none of the stuff we're saying, I mean, we, we got to do the, the legal stuff, but none of the stuff we're saying is an open solicitation for investment. We're just two guys that like finance and we're just talking about what we're into. So, you know, whether you do or don't do something, um, don't let this show be any bearing on that. But but that being said, um, are you guys looking at still new projects that are out there in a, in a non-solicitous way? But are you? Yeah, yeah. You know, so like everything this? we say here is for educational purposes only. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> we're just disclaiming the heck out <laughs> of this. My, my general <laughs> disclaimer. But no, we're, we're absolutely, we're, we're looking for new projects um, all around yeah. the United States. Um, yeah. We're looking for things that are you know, specifically like uh, a new solar farm, stuff like that would be really exciting. Yeah. Um, something that's in uh, a rural area, um, something that's in a, a, a targeted employment area. Those things yeah. are highly marketable to our investors, uh, our investor base. And um, it's something that really helps the, the U.S. economy. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things I, I, I didn't mention, but, you know, through all the different projects that we've done, we've created over 20,000 new U.S. jobs for our American people. Now, that's a patriot. Yeah, I, I, that's one thing I've just, again, I, I told you, I'm really happy with what I do. I'm really proud of it. And that's Should one of the be. things that really makes me proud is that what we've done, and what our company's done. And it's all been through this foreign investment that's allowed that to happen. And it's right. we started it right during the great financial crisis. Yeah, and let me connect those dots uh, for our audience around the world is saying when George started, he even said, he's like, I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I compared to what I know now, I didn't know any of that stuff. And now look at, he... He decided that today's the day. Today is day one, and he started it, and now he's looking back. And because he made that decision, 20,000 jobs were created from that one decision. So this isn't, yes, we talk about making billions, and sure, like we don't neglect the income that you made, but it's the impact. Every single guest, and you're one of them, every single guest on this show says it was the impact that kept me going, not the income. We don't neglect the income, but we're certainly not driven by it. We enjoy it. But what drives us, what gets us up early and keeps us up late is the impact we're making, the jobs we're creating, investing in the country that we love. And, and so, so you know, I, I won't do it on the show, but, you know, classic uh, head nod and slow clap to you, brother. That, that is absolutely incredible. So, you know, as, as we conclude on the show, I hope you enjoyed our time with George and I. Um, learn the difference between being uh, revolutionary and evolutionary and, you know, and pick those things. Also, decide on day one rather than one day. Don't be a entrepreneur. Be like Georgia. Just get started, man. You don't have to know everything or wait for perfect uh, scenarios, right? Done is better than perfect. So just, just start. Don't be obsessed with perfect or one day. Just get it going. You do these things and you too will be well on your way in your pursuit of making billions. Wow. What a show. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Now, if you haven't done so already, be sure to leave a comment and review on new ideas and guests you want me to bring on for future episodes. Plus, why don't you head over to YouTube and see extra takes while you get to know our guests even better. And make sure to come back for our next episode where we dive even deeper into the people, the process, and the perspectives of both investors and founders. Until then, my friends, stay hungry, focus on your goals, and keep grinding towards your dream of making billions.